Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, excellent. Um, my name is Maryam Rosai, um, as Nelson said, um, and this morning I'm coming to you from the territories of the Lekwungen people in Victoria, BC. That is to say, it is ridiculously early for me. So if I'm slow in forming sentences, please blame it on that and bear with me. Um, I have spent the past decade doing a lot of work on um, energy justice and energy poverty um, across Canada, but mostly focusing my on the ground work, uh, which is the work that I consider counts um, in BC and Alberta. Um, but today I'm hoping to share with you some recent insights from the research on energy poverty broadly in Canada and the United States. Um, and in doing so, I'm hoping to take inspiration from this famous quote, um, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it is justice. Um, you all might've seen a TED talk by Brian Stevenson on this. I'm sure the idea has older roots than that, but that's how most of us know this quote. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is um, look at energy poverty from a justice lens. Um, and I think in doing so, we'll get to see some new facets of the problem that are worth talking about. Um, so to start with, I'm actually going to start talking about justice and how people think about justice. Um, there's generally three conceptions of justice that sort of apply here. Um, the first one that most people know best is the distributional idea of justice. And that's um, the idea that people should have equitable access to the good things in life. Um, and if there are bad things in life, those things should also be equitably distributed. So it shouldn't be the same people bearing the burden of everything. Um, if we apply that to questions of energy, this could be having affordable energy, um, like heating and electricity available to everybody. Um, but it could also mean things like um, not having the same groups of people bear the burden of our energy generation decisions. So if we're building say mega dams and the same kinds of people are getting displaced every time, um, that's a distributional uh, justice issue. Um, the next idea of justice is procedural justice. And that has to do with people's ability to participate in making decisions for the life of their community. Um, this is a political idea of justice. Can people shape their future? Um, and applied to energy, it really is about, are, those, are the people who are impacted um, able to participate in making decisions about what the future looks like? Um, and this is why I'm very encouraged by the work that Bridgewater is doing in, in doing engagement work, because that's essentially procedural justice in action. Um, and the last idea that applies here is a recognition-based idea of justice. And that focuses on recognizing that people come with different needs. Um, what is energy need for some groups of people might be different from others based on cultural expectations around comfort or based on community ways of life, um, but also that people, for people to participate um, and to be able to participate um, in decision-making, we might need to address in, uh, existing inequalities. Um, so if certain people, say women, um, always have to deal with childcare um, and all of our decision-making events happen at a, at a time when women have to provide childcare and we do not provide childcare at our events, we're, we're not recognizing that that need, to, that need needs to be addressed in order to get participation by women. Um, so when it comes to energy, as I mentioned, this comes to this, uh, this can look like recognizing that people from different parts of the world might want their um, homes warm to a different temperature or that certain groups of people um, say, uh, folks that have existing health conditions might need to have warmer homes and higher energy needs. Um, it also plays out in interesting ways in, in the way that we make decisions about um, meeting energy needs more broadly um, at the energy policy level. And I hope to speak to some of that um, in a little bit. So with that, um, I'm going to um, share some new definitions of energy poverty. Um, most of the time people talk about having a hard time meeting one's energy needs as the primary definition. Um, and this is like where we focus on affordability um, of meeting our heating and electricity and whatever needs at home. 
Um, but we can also start thinking about having a hard time accessing energy technologies that are important to the life of the community, uh, particularly energy efficient technologies. Um, if, if we think that is the solution to reducing energy burdens for folks, then we should also ask, can people access um, these technologies? Um, we can also think about the procedural idea of justice and, and look at the way that people get to partake in, in, in shaping their community's energy future. Um, or go back to just proportional, uh, a proportional idea of justice and think about um, people who experience a disproportionate share of negative consequences of energy decisions. Um, and lastly, um, not having one's energy needs recognized will tap into that recognition idea of injustice. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is pick each of these and share what um, some research um, in Canada or the United States. Um, and I had to bring in the United States because some of the research in Canada is limited, um, says about each of these things. So I'm gonna start with the top one, um, the one that we um, know most about. Um, and that often gets framed as a question of affordability. I know many of you are familiar with the housing affordability index that CMHC puts out. Um, this is a similar idea. Um, we create a metric called household energy burden, which is essentially looking at household energy costs um, for your electricity bill, for your heating bills, um, dividing that by the household income. Um, and that gives you a sense of like, how much of a burden is this for each household? Uh, when we look at this number across Canada, it's really um, quite a low percentage of household income that gets spent on energy uh, costs for most people. Most people spend less than 2.8% of their income um, on that. Um, but let's round that up and say 3%. Um, and if people are spending more than twice that amount, then that we can say that's a disproportionate um, amount of uh, burden on them. So this is how we define a, a threshold uh, for energy poverty. Um, households that spend more than 6% of their net household income on energy services um, can be considered having a higher energy burden. And by this metric, um, Canada has about 20% of its household households experiencing energy poverty. This number was true in 2000, by 2011 data, which was my PhD work, um, and by 2016 data, which is some work that we did with CUSP. Um, I also um, dug up what this number is for the census division area that Bridgewater is located in. Um, and compared to the 20% across Canada, it is 49% in your area. Um, and I'm sure this is not surprising to you or folks that know about energy poverty in Canada, the Maritimes have um, some of the highest incidences of energy poverty. Um, I'm going to share some characteristics um, that comes across in data um, and noting that a lot of things don't. Um, so that's what this table is. It's um, just what you can see with very high level limited census data. Um, and I'm gonna start with talking about household incomes. Um, what I've done is I've pulled out general population household incomes, median household incomes, um, and for folks who would meet the definition of energy poverty. And one thing that we see and that a lot of people find surprising is that um, the folks who are in energy poverty actually have higher median incomes than general population. And so that might be raising red flags for you and being like, what is going on? And I'll speak to that in a minute. But another thing that I want to point out is that um, while 21% of this area uh, meets a low income definition um, by LICO, which is the low income cutoff, 37% um, of the people who are in energy poverty meet this definition. So this category of people, people who have these higher energy burdens um, have higher low income people in that group, but also higher incomes than um, than general population. So you might be like, what is going on? Um, and the reason this happens is that energy poverty is really different from income um, inequalities. Um, that's certainly a part of it. So you will always have people who have low incomes and because their incomes are low, regardless of what their energy costs are, that burden is gonna be high on them. Um, so 
when we talk about energy poverty and addressing it, my first recommendation is always like advocate for higher incomes for folks, um, particularly on social assistance. Um, and that will take care of your low income folks. But um, energy poverty is also a, a function of housing quality. And one of the things that happens as your income goes up, as you can see with a second row, second column, um, people start being able to afford to buy houses. Uh, they might buy bigger houses um, and they might start buying single detached houses um, rather than smaller townhouses or apartment buildings. Um, um, and that just means higher energy needs. Um, and their energy needs go up faster than their income goes up, um, which is what you might see a picture like this. So energy poverty is definitely not limited to low income folks. Um, it, it cuts across the working class uh, demographics. Um, and housing quality is um, an important factor here, which is why I put in the stat about um, single detached homes, which are a bit more prevalent in, um, in the group with energy poverty. Um, the other thing that I was able to pull out from census data is that houses, and, and this will not surprise anybody again, um, but if you live in a house that needs major repairs, you're gonna be more likely to experience energy poverty. And, and we see that reflected in the data. I wanted to look at some demographic variables um, as well and see who, uh, what kinds of households we could point to and say, these are the ones who are at higher risk of energy poverty. So one, one demographic group that stood out for me is seniors in this area, 45% uh, of the people in energy poverty in this area are seniors. Um, so that's a demographic group to pay attention to. Um, the fact that I haven't presented any data on racialized communities doesn't mean that these people aren't um, worse off. Um, it, what it means is that I'm looking at census data, which is quite limited in its representation um, of racialized community. When you're working with folks who are a tiny percentage of the population to begin with, um, your sampling strategy won't necessarily reflect their experience. Um, so I might not be able to see that with data from the census at this level, but your underground work shows um, that racialized people, particularly Black Nova, Nova Scotians, um, experience a lot of discrimination um, and hardship around energy poverty. Um, so that um, is a testament to the power of doing work on the ground. Um, and um, I'm very glad to see that you guys are doing this good work. Um, now I'm hoping to advance. Okay, um, next I wanna share some research on um, facing barriers to accessing energy technologies. And when I look at that, I ask a few questions like, can people afford certain technologies? Can people um, modify their homes to install these technologies? And here we can get into some of the differences between renters and owners. Um, and do people encounter other barriers in access? Um, and some interesting data also comes out when, when you ask that question. Um, so to begin with, I'll share two pieces of research which look at access to energy efficiency programming. Um, and this is really important because we know making the home more energy efficient is one of the solutions to energy poverty. Um, so in the first piece of research, um, the researchers went to, both of these come from the US um, and I want to say Michigan. Um, the researchers went to shops in low income areas and to not low income areas and they tried buying energy efficient light bulbs. Um, what they found was that in the low income areas, they had a hard time actually finding these light bulbs in the shops. And um, when they could, it was twice as expensive. So not only do you have people who are, who have lower incomes and probably face higher barriers um, to accessing things anyway, but they also have to pay twice as much as rich folks um, for the same technologies. Um, the next piece of research was taking a more systematic look uh, and looking at utility, uh, utility spending. Um, and this is something that we can do for all of our local utilities. Um, 
across Canada and our provinces. Um, they looked at how many dollars were spent on energy efficiency programming for low income groups versus what was spent on middle and high income groups. And they found for every $1 on low income groups, 4.3 was spent on middle and high income groups. And um, this will not be surprising because when we do energy efficiency programs for low income folks, it's like a, a CFL light bulb and some weather stripping. And when we do energy efficiency programs for middle and high income folks, it's like, here's a lot of money for a heat pump. Um, and so this is a disparity that we need to address in our programming and can be, um, and, and it's something that we need to be asking of our utilities um, locally, um, more systematically across Canada. The next set of research um, gets at some of the things that I categorized in the other category, um, like what other barriers people might be facing, um, and specifically racism. Um, so in these two pieces of research, in the first one, they, the researchers looked at the installation of solar uh, PV in Black and Hispanic majority neighborhoods versus neighborhoods with similar incomes that were white or didn't have a dominant race um, attached to them. And what they found was that there was less of them installed in black and Hispanic majority neighborhoods. Um, and this is after you've taken income into account. So regardless of income, racialized communities have less access to this technology. Um, so we might be asking ourselves, what is happening? Um, and so to answer it, we might think about how these installations happen. Uh, particularly how recruitment for these kinds of programs happen. Um, and, um, and that's questions like, where are we advertising these things? Um, what language are we advertising these programs in? Um, are we, where are we doing our engagement work? Where are we doing our outreach work? Um, are our installers or program delivery agents um, thinking that racialized people aren't interested in environmentalism the same way that white people are. And if that's an assumption that people have al along with all these other decisions that they make around how they do recruitment, um, who they think can afford things, who is interested in things. Um, and in fact, who installers are, if people of color aren't reflected in the trades that do this work, do the installation work, um, they, they won't think they, they might not feel comfortable, they might not know somebody in the trades who they can call and have these things installed for them. Um, so this cuts across a whole lot of questions of systemic racism um, and how it plays out in access to energy technology. Um, in the next piece of research, they looked at the California Clean Vehicle Rebate Pro Program and they found that 83% of the participants had incomes above $100,000 a year. Now we might ask, is this really an efficient way of creating market transformation by paying people who can probably afford to buy this thing on their own? Um, or should we be focusing on making these technologies accessible to people who wouldn't be able to um, buy these things on their own? Um, but that aside, um, this program also disproportionately benefited white buyers. So when it comes to access to technologies that we consider technologies of the future um, or energy efficiency technology, which is what we need to make our homes sustainable now um, and our bills sustainable as well, um, people of color are having a hard time and low income people um, are disproportionately affected. Um, so that is uh, that is the question of technology which isn't getting a lot of attention in Canada. And I hope that those of you who think about research um, can start thinking about looking at some of these questions um, and what they look like in Canada. Um, I'm now going to talk about the next three conceptions of energy poverty. Um, I'm gonna talk about all three of them using the same case study, which is from my own work. Um, and so this is your Canadian content. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the community of Seiki Dene, uh, which is a First Nations community located in the Rocky Mountain Trench um, in Northern BC. Um, if you look at that pin on that map, it's right at the top of what looks like a body of water. 
And that body of water is um, the reservoir for the WEC Bennett Dam, which is one of the largest dams in BC. Um, this community was um, displaced from their homes to build that dam um, in the 60s. Um, and while they got displaced, they never got hooked up to the electricity grid. Um, so not only did they have to bear the burden of this energy development, but they didn't get any of the benefits of it. Um, and because of this, this is an off-grid community that burns diesel for their electricity use and understandably has a very tense relationship with a local utility provider, which is BC Hydro. The community is working on and has for a number of years been working on building their own community energy project. And that is uh, facing a lot of challenges in different, um, in different ways. Uh, and I'll speak about some of them. Um, so before I fully advance to that slide, let's have a qualitative researcher appreciation moment. When, when you're a quantitative researcher, you show one stat and it summarizes all of your research um, nicely. When you do qualitative work, you have to show an entire conversation. Um, and so here I am showing the entire transcript. It's not the entire transcript. It's a segment of a transcript, um, which I'm putting up here um, to share with you the idea that um, feeling disempowered around communities' energy decisions um, affecting those um, is, is, is a facet of energy poverty that folks in Seike experience. Um, so in this interview, I said, um, you said it would be cool to have your own community power. Why? Like, why would it be? Why do you think that is cool? And this person whose name I've changed to protect his identity says, well, then BC Hydro wouldn't have a lot to say. But then we also use BC Hydro's money to operate a lot of income in the village. Um, it's a touchy subject. Uh, before I proceed, I just want to point out that there is this unwelcome dependency on the utility provider, which the community wants to, wants to address. Um, and so I press on, why is it so touchy? And Jason says, because of the fact that BC Hydro is helping with putting us to work in little projects here and there, that's the only income out this way. It's actually run by BC Hydro. BC Hydro is putting the money on our table, so it makes it, we play by the rules. Uh, Jason then goes on to discuss a hypothetical scenario in which the community is put it, wants to put up um, wind turbines. It's a hypothetical scenario. Um, and he's like, no, but BC Hydro would never let us do that because it's not in their interest. Um, and the reason I bring this up um, is, is to point out that there's certainly an impression of disempowerment. Um, it's not just around energy decisions. Um, they certainly feel that they wouldn't be able to do, um, make, make the right decisions for their community because of their relationship with BC Hydro in the energy sector. But by and large, they also feel in a lot of ways um, that they have to play by BC Hydro rules um, in other areas as well. Um, and this kind of feeling around shaping our energy future has a lot, um, is, is a big part of um, being able to participate, whether you think participation is even worth it, whether you can participate, whether there are forums for you to even participate in, um, in shaping the energy decisions of your community. Um, but also if you can't participate, you can't, um, change existing inequalities around distribution, uh, distributional ideas of justice. Um, so this is, this is a really key thing to note when you're working with a community um, is their feelings of, um, or their feelings around how to participate um, and, and whether they actually can. Um, so now I want to talk about how um, this feeling actually plays out in real life um, when the community tried to build their own um, energy project. Um, so this is a picture of the reservoir uh, of the dam and you see some wood collecting there. Um, the community was hoping to collect these uh, debris. Um, they're right now, what, what they do is this wood collects um, on the reservoir. Community members are paid in one of those projects of here and there that uh, Jason mentioned to collect it and burn it. And what the community wanted to do was to turn that into power. So it turned something that was a negative in their community into something that was a positive. Um, and so they were gonna develop a biomass project. Um, and I'm going to try and explain something that's fairly technical. Um, so bear with me. 
when when you're a renewable energy producer, a small renewable energy producer, um, say you make your own biomass project, um, what you do in BC is you sell that power back to the electricity grid, which is operated by BC Hydro. Um, and BC Hydro sells it to customers. Um, that transaction, the part where you make the power and put it back on the grid, um, is governed by something called the energy purchase agreement. Um, and the energy purchase agreement essentially lays out how much energy you're selling, what price you're selling it at, maybe what characteristics it has. Um, it is the technical bit of all this is that when you are in a remote community that's off the grid, um, how much energy you sell, i.e. how much revenues you generate, um, is essentially limited by how much energy your community consumes because it's not like the extras can get sold somewhere else. Um, so the question of how much energy the community consumes is a really central part of the discussions around an energy purchase agreement. Um, and I want to spend some time talking about um, what the community, what people thought the community consumes um, to, to, bring out, um, to bring our attention to how we can recognize or not recognize legitimate energy needs um, in the energy policy and planning work that um, more technical folks do. Um, so the community developed an estimate of what they thought they would be using, um, and that's the yellow bars in this graph. And the BC Hydro, which is the local utility, um, also developed an estimate, which is uh, the blue bar. And you see there's a difference between the two. Um, the BC Hydro number comes from what the community was consuming in that moment, um, in that year. Um, and they were like, we expect it would be the same forever. Um, and the community was saying, no, like we plan on making certain infrastructural changes in this community, will, which will change our energy demand. Um, in this case, the community had a lot of propane heaters and people couldn't afford uh, to buy propane. So frequently in the dead of winter, they would run out of propane, they wouldn't be able to um, buy more. So they would be out of heating and hot water. Uh, and what the community was doing was putting in electric hot waters and electric heating in all the homes. Um, and that bill was paid for by the nation. So they were effectively dealing with some of their energy poverty um, problems in their community by doing this. Um, so that if people couldn't afford their propane, there was electric heat um, and they wouldn't be out of hot water. Um, this meant their electricity demand would go up. Um, and so they estimated how much that would be and um, would suggest to BC Hydro that in the next few years, that's where their demand was going to be. So that's the number we should plan for. Um, what happened, and this is a quote from the engineer who was designing the system for them, um, was they, um, the, Okay, I'll just read the quote. At the meeting, the question of the electricity load forecast was raised and BC Hydro stated that they would only sign an EPA, that's an energy purchase agreement, for the existing electricity consumption in the village and that they would not accept the artificial fuel switch to electric heating as described in the proposal. So um, essentially what's happening here is BC Hydro is saying this this energy demand that you have highlighted is an artificial one. It's not a legitimate one. We're not going to meet it. Um, it seems like a fairly technical decisions and one that we maybe like lay folks shouldn't dig into and question, but, but I think we should. Um, what's happening here is they're saying the community essentially can't have a future, that their consumption is limited to where it is today and no changes are allowed. Um, of course, this is not how we make decisions when we make plans for meeting um, the energy needs of the larger electricity grid in BC, we say, oh, this, this industry might come, it will have this kind of a demand, let's plan for that. This kind of technology might get used um, in homes and it will change our demand in this way, let's plan for that. We allow for, for our energy needs to change, we essentially allow for a future. Whereas apply to this off-grid setting, this very technical seeming policy is saying, no, your energy demands, your future energy demands are not legitimate demands. Um, the effect of this decision for the community was that it made their project too financially risky um, because they, it wouldn't generate enough revenues. Um, 
This was one of the issues in this negotiation. And so in effect, it, the project didn't go ahead. They had to press pause. They've since resurrected it and press pause on it a number of times, um, but they're still going. Um, what I do want to point out though, because as you see that report was written in 2013. So we have the benefit of hindsight here. Um, what happened in 2017, um, as I was finishing this work, um, my thesis, I, I heard through the grapevine, um, I heard through my work actually, um, that BC Hydro, that community demand had actually reached where the yellow bars were um, and that BC Hydro had to buy some new diesel generators in an emergency kind of way to, to meet it. Um, so actually the community was quite right in, in, in their estimate of what their future looked like. And this is why we should listen to folks um, about their experience and about their plans. Um, because they are experts in their own lives and in their own futures and they know better than people sitting in Vancouver offices um, how their energy demand might change and what might be a legitimate energy need for them. So I have talked a long time um, so I'm going to try and wrap up um, in a succinct way. Um, what I want to say is that those of us who work on energy poverty we don't do it because it's interesting. We don't do it because it's like, because we're interested in it in theory. We do it because we're practical people and we want to solve it. Um, and when you take that as your starting point, um, that justice is a practical project, um, how you define a problem and how you define solutions to it then becomes really key. Um, so the research, some of the research that I've shown and in, in looking at it from the justice perspective um, has allowed us to see that energy poverty is a multifaceted problem. Um, and this, when you look at it in this way, you can see that it's actually closely linked to processes of energy generation and extraction and practices of energy and resource planning that deem some demands legitimate and others not. Also, that is closely linked to existing processes of marginalization and exploitation, colonialism, racism, economic exploitations of working class, um, and the like. Um, and mechanisms for addressing energy poverty need to be fundamentally altering all of these patterns. So it's all well and good to invest in energy efficiency. I've spent most of my life working on energy efficiency. In fact, I believe in energy efficiency um, as a really key part of the solutions to energy poverty. But where I'm really encouraged by the work that Bridgewater is doing is, is the fact that they are focusing on um, engaging with people on the ground or focusing on looking at the links between energy poverty and racism. Um, they're considering questions of colonialism and thinking about how these larger systemic problems are playing out um, in experiences of energy access. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. It's been a pleasure being here with you this morning. Um, and I will perhaps just put this slide up, um, which has some of the sources um, of where the research comes from. Um, and otherwise open it up to questions if there are any. And I don't know if someone's facilitating that or if I should just take them myself, but let me know. Thank you, Dr. Rizai. Um, so I've seen some comments bouncing back and forth. So if anyone would, has any questions or comments in terms of what's happening here in Nova Scotia, I would like for you to just open your mic and speak. And when you've completed, if you would actually um, close your mic again and then the next person can speak. I know Dave, or Dave, Brian, and Miles, do you have anything you'd like to say? We can start with Brian. Just let me think about that for a second. I will come up with something. Just hold on a second. Thank you. Okay, so while you're thinking, does anyone else have anything they would like to say, comment, or question? I'd just like to say that I thoroughly enjoyed Dr. Ozai's uh, talk, and there's lots to process there. And also in combination with uh, uh, the information that Francis put forth, um, I think we really need to look very, very deep into this subject 
especially here in the Maritimes, of what we're not doing to provide equal energy to everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, looking at this recording and breaking it down and hopefully, and coming up with solutions with our, our breakout rooms or with uh, j just myself so we can take this to another level. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Thank you Alden. Thank you. Uh, Brian, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I first learned of your research a year ago when Efficiency Canada put out their annual report showing province by province what was happening and they quoted you and uh, it was, uh, I'm with the Affordable Energy Coalition here in Nova Scotia and uh, some of your research kind of challenged some of the things that we had been thinking up until then. So it was really helpful to get that wake up call about the um, the fact that uh, there's a lot more homeowners than tenants who are actually directly affected by energy poverty and that a lot of them are not low income. So that was something that really, um, like I say, was a challenge to what we've been thinking up until then. So I've done a bunch of research to try and get the local figures on that and it has confirmed those basic ideas. And my question to you is um, when you start thinking about we also found, like you said, that seniors are, are and we already had a hunch about this, but we've got figures showing that uh, as people get older, they're more likely to be in energy poverty once they're retired. Um, so one of the questions I have to you is um, at what, like for people with the lowest incomes who experience energy poverty, they obviously have a much harder time paying the bills and actually have practical impacts that affect them a lot more than people who are at higher incomes. So as you point out, there are a lot of working class people and seniors who are not low income, but modest income, who experience problems with energy poverty. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of at what level of income, um, even though they're paying more than 6%, it's no longer such a big issue. Like at, 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 what, at what level would you suggest that the modest income uh, group that's hurt by energy poverty um, can handle their bills even though they're paying more than 6%? <laughs> it's a hard question. It's a hard question and I don't know that I want to answer that. Uh, that's <laughs> okay. the other part of it. Um, I, so when I have the flexibility of, uh, I mean the question I would pose to you is why why do you need to put a number on that? Um, and like when I have been asked to put a number on that, it's usually been for purposes of like program administration. And if I could design an ideal program, um, how I would get around this is I would ask people um, if they consider their energy bills a burden. Um, and people with high incomes just say, no, it's not a burden. Um, so, what in fact I, I designed a pilot program a few years ago and and that was like the first question into our funnel of determining eligibility it was like are energy bills for you would you say they are a high financial burden a moderate financial burden or not a burden at all and if people say it was a moderate or high then we ask them like the next question of like okay like what are your energy bills and what is your income and looked into that um and that question just filtered out anything that you would worry about I mean, ultimately that program actually made me come up with a number of like, okay, this is the maximum income we will consider um, just because you have to be transparent if you're designing programs so people know. Um, but honestly, we never had to apply that, that filter once we put the subjective filter on. Um, so I, yeah, I think I would, if, if I had the flexibility of trusting people on their own assessment of their lives, that's probably the best way to go. Um, and I think like I, I'm resistant to putting a threshold on there because it's just so specific to people's um, specific conditions. Like if you're a household of seven, it's a very different situation than if you're a household of two. Um, and and so I would I would struggle with putting a number there. Yeah, that's that sounds like a good answer. And I am thinking about it in terms of programs <laughs> because right now Nova Scotia has some very very good programs that are targeted at low income people. And the question is, if we were to try and advocate for expanding to the modest income people that you've identified, which I think is a really good idea. The question is, 
in practical terms, how would you do that? And I like that idea of the questionnaire, you know, people could apply and then you'd ask them that series of questions, I guess. And even, I mean, if, if they had to apply, they would first have to self-identify as somebody who's having trouble, I guess, too. So, yeah, it's interesting. This is for efficiency programs that I'm talking about, right? Yeah, this was also an efficiency program. Yeah. Maybe if you could supply those series of questions that you followed, like the follow-up ones, that would be helpful for us to think about here. I'd be happy to do that. Um, if you could send me an email, my email is somewhere on those slides, um, or I will put it in the chat box. If you send me an email, I would be happy to do that. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. No problem. Yes, it would be great if you put it in the chat and everyone would have an opportunity to take it down if need be. So thank you. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more question or comment before we need to go to break. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Rathai. So thank you so much for joining us. I know it's early out there on the West Coast and we really appreciate you getting up and joining us this morning. Um, so we're going to take another stretch break, a little bit about five minutes, and then we'll be showing another little brief music video before we go into the breakout rooms. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Okay. okay and I'm just going to yes. say I, I have to take my kid to daycare, so alas, I don't <laughs> get to come back and participate. Um, and uh, it looks super interesting and I'm sad to miss out. Um, but um, I would be very happy to hear from any of you. So just let me know. Thank you for joining us. I really okay, appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, everyone. Bye. A little break. <laughs> thank you.